Not red. There it ah, is. Ah, there we go. All right. Welcome again, everyone. Ah, so our assumptions. We assume that you know money still talks in a male voice. Our financial systems, our rules and tools were not invented by us generally, and generally omit whose name and discount females. Racial violence drove New World colonization, sought to van vanquish Native cultures and desecrated Native lands. While US slavery ended 157 years ago, systemic racial exploitation remains and is part of the brand, I'm afraid. Women have always worked, but only in the past 50 years or so have the majority of women and young mothers especially entered the modern job market in such numbers. Women and people of color are now uh, business owners and financial managers, and yet their caring remains uncounted. Economics from the word, uh, the Greek word oikonomia literally means household management. And we know that women's know-how can change an economy that is now waged as war into one waging life. Growing inequality and environmental ruin and perpetual war making tells us that we cannot afford more alpha male only business as usual. So that's where we're going to start. Our intentions tonight are to grow your economic competence and your life waging value. We trust that each woman's identity is shaped and strengthened by discovery of her own economic truth. We all have an economic story that we're not really encouraged to think about or talk about. So that's part of the reason for these Zooms of our own. We honor all the stages in women's ways of knowing, which begins in silence. We can feel afraid and um, seen but not heard. Uh, we move on to receiving knowledge from authorities. We listen to those voices. Then we develop subjective knowledge. We begin to listen to our own inner voice and protect it, feel a little bit fearful. After that, we move on to procedural knowledge where we understand not only what different people think, but also how their perspectives were formed. And we become curious about that. And we make some decisions about who we think are more trustworthy and logical than others might be. And constructive knowledge is where we trust our ability to pursue knowledge by listening to other divorce voices, considering a lot of complicated contexts and collaborating while communicating thoughts and questions. And this last sentence is really important. We can hold and remodel our ideas with passion and pleasure. We intend to have fun tonight. We hope you're going to um, learn some things tonight, all of us from each other. And uh, we're really looking forward to that. So, um, I've uh, already introduced you a little bit to our, our uh, panelists here, and um, we're going to explore how this uh, different business model could help you and your community, and why exactly the growing number of cooperative businesses are um, being founded by uh, people of color and women in particular, why they're the greatest number of those populating this new um, relatively new business model, although it's not all that new, is it? Um, we'll find out more about that. What makes them different exactly? Uh, why are women drawn to them? And how do you start one? How can, where can you get some help? So those are some of the ideas that we're going to uh, discuss and in more detail. I'm going to ask uh, Jamila and Georgia to each um, introduce themselves and Tell us a bit about uh, your expertise, but also how you knew that you had to uh, work to change this economy. When did that happen? And who or what influenced you? You know, feminists uh, told us, uh, the last generation, that um, the personal is political. 
Well, we think the personal is also economic. And so uh, we wonder, how did you find this path? Where, what got you started? Georgia, do you wanna begin the conversation? Sure. Um, well, before I founded Praxis Peace Institute, and many of you probably do not know, I was a professional musician. So my interest in economics didn't come from studying business or economics in college, but as a musician running my own record label. As a harpist and composer, I knew that no record company was going to sign me. That was, I was not what they were looking for. So I decided to put out my own album and sell it through metaphysical bookstores, which at the time uh, they were starting to sell records and cassettes. So I recorded an album, sold it to these bookstores across the country, and I was in business shortly after I put out the album. Uh, I won't go into all the marketing details, which I learned on the fly because that was the only way I could learn them at the time. But suffice to say that I went from having such a little income that I didn't need to pay income taxes as a musician to making more than most of my women friends, if not all of them at the time. And that happened within a four month period of releasing that album. So of course, I didn't know much about business. So I didn't realize that this wouldn't last forever. Uh, and that was my downfall in a way, because it, uh, it didn't last forever. I had a good 10 to 12 years before um, this came to a kind of an abrupt end in a way, although it wasn't really abrupt, it took time. And part of that happened because the music industry changed as all things do. And mega companies like CBS, MCA, and other large companies began buying up small labels and signing independent artists. So at that point, I signed onto a company that had CBS distribution and thought this was gonna be a good move. They promised larger sales, which they did deliver, but they didn't really tell me how much less of the pie I was gonna have. So within one year, my income decreased two thirds of what I'd had the year before when I was running my own business. So this was a shock to, to lose two thirds of one's income within a year. And I, I actually was, uh, I, I would say this is when I started really thinking about economics and, and money. And um, what I saw after you know, the new iterations of the record business is that each new iteration, the artist received less and less of the economic pie. The distribution company, the record company and the store, all each of them were making more than the artist who provided the material in the first place. So this seemed incredibly unfair. And uh, I felt like and many of the artists I spoke with felt like we were owned by the company store. We had to have um, we had to sign multi record a deal of contracts that we would promise to deliver. I got out of mine, but that's another story I won't go into here. Um, but a few years later, this was not forgotten. I was working as a volunteer for our former California Governor Jerry Brown's organization, We the People. And at that time, I was scheduling guests for his radio show. And one day, Terry Molner, who was co-founder of a social responsibility investment company, in fact, one of the first, uh, spent the hour talking about the Mondragon cooperatives in Spain. And I had never heard of them before. And But this was just the kind of business I was interested in learning more about and was enthralled with everything I was hearing about it. So I decided that day I had to learn more about Mondragon and about worker-owned businesses. Eventually, when I started Praxis, I decided to reach out to Mondragon and I contacted them to have to request one of their people to come and speak at a conference that we were producing in Dubrovnik, Croatia. And fortunately, one of them did come to our conference and spoke about Mondragon and about worker-owned cooperatives. And while he was there, we just decided to put together a week-long seminar at Mondragon the following year so that people could come from the US and learn about worker ownership. And that was the beginning of my relationship to cooperatives. We have now brought 10 groups to learn at the Mondragon Cooperatives in Spain. And we will bring our 11th group of uh, September 11th to 17th this year. So for me, Mondragon is not only the exemplary business model uh, for how to live responsibly, empathically, and in harmony with people and planet, 
but it really shows us an evolved model of business and an evolved model of how we can relate to each other in business. So it's been a, a driving force in my life since uh, I first became aware of the Mondragon cooperatives. And of course, I've looked at cooperatives and know a fair amount about them in the US, but that will come up in our conversation today, I think. Thank you. Jamila. All right, well, hello everyone. It's a, a delight to be with you all talking about cooperatives, um, the intersection of economic and racial justice. Um, and I guess I, I kind of stumbled upon uh, cooperatives really um, after having, I don't know, about worked 15 years in a variety of nonprofit organizations that were um, providing different kinds of um, social good uh, to communities. Um, and probably about a decade ago, as I was wrapping up my uh, graduate school um, coursework, I took on a job at um, a food co-op, Mariposa Food Co-op here in um, West Philadelphia as their membership coordinator. And it was the first time that I encountered um, the co-op business model. And at that time, um, an organization called the Philadelphia Area Cooperative Alliance was also coming into formation. And so Philadelphia is a city in the US that is fortunate to have a very rich and long tradition of cooperative enterprise um, building um, here in Philly. And so the and a diverse um, representation of kinds of cooperatives and ownership structures. So we have food co-ops and worker-owned co-ops and housing co-ops and credit unions, providing all manner of, um, of, of need and care for, um, for our communities. And so I decided to volunteer with the Philadelphia Area Cooperative Alliance so that I could learn about co-ops so that I could recruit people to uh, join the food co-op because that was my job. So I figured I'd have to have something compelling to say about cooperatives. Um, and, you know, and over time, um, that interest in cooperatives really deepened. I think I transitioned from having this notion of um, having worked in the nonprofit sector where I really felt like I was helping people um, and, you know, and being of service. I really came to see within the cooperative um, and mutual aid, the solidarity economy, a different pathway of really being engaged in work that was about my liberation connected to other people's liberation, right? That we were at this point where we could work towards our collective's um, needs, really supporting people and practicing and, and um, experiencing self-determination. And um, so through that work, I continued to engage with PACA um, I eventually became the executive director of, um, of PACA, supporting cooperatives um, and individuals and groups within the Philadelphia region who are interested in forming cooperatives and um, growing the co-op economy, advocating for them as well. And that all is really rooted, I think, in my childhood, how I really came to this work and why it felt also very familiar to me. It didn't seem like I was learning something new. And it's because um, I grew up um, in a, a tradition, a Southern Baptist Black church tradition um, in a neighborhood um, that was working class and poor, majority um, Black and Latinx. And our church community practiced cooperative economics. They bought up the block, <laughs> right, and empowered um, members of our church community to have ownership. They organized around housing justice to secure and provide um, affordable housing programs um, in our communities. So I've learned a lot of these skills and saw a lot of these practices around cooperation modeled for me. And I think we all, each and every one of us has some familiarity with cooperation through our, you know, our lived experience. Um, and so, you know, having worked in the sector in particular, it took me quite a while to really make that connection back to um, my childhood and, and, and really rooting and, and 
connecting back with roots and culture. And I think that will come up um, a bit more as we have our conversations tonight. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, both our organizations that you're representing, uh, the well, you're, you're not representing it any longer, Jamila, um, but PACA is a terrific organization. Uh, people should check out their, their webpage. There's a wonderful history of uh, African-American cooperative uh, economic thinking uh, that's been prevalent in Philadelphia for a long time. It's a great, um, great educational piece. And Praxis Peace Institute out in California are doing all kinds of exciting things, uh, discussing books and uh, Georgia interviews, uh, interesting folks who have innovative economic ideas, um, great organizations um, that we should uh, support. Um, so tell us, tell us more about uh, what what makes um, the um, cooperative model different from the standard uh, corporate model, uh, small business model that that we have that that we, women are already um, getting familiar with. Uh, what what makes what what makes it distinctively different? Do you think? Uh, maybe I can take part of it, and Jamila can take part of this. Uh, yeah. Especially because uh, the one part I wasn't going to talk about was consumer co-ops because I really don't know much about those. Um, I do know something about, uh, well, there's a difference between two different co-ops that I think it's important for people to know. They're the worker-owned co-ops where there's one worker, one share, one vote. And then there are the ESOPs, which is the employee stock ownership uh, program. And that is where an employee can buy a certain number of shares. So those are two different models of cooperatives. And the one that I'm most familiar with is the worker owned one vote, one share um, model. And that I know cooperatives in the Bay Area here that are built on that model, like the Arismendi Bakeries, which is a group of six different uh, bakeries that are all worker owned in the Bay Area. And then there's the Alvarado Street Bakery that is a wholesale bakery. They sell all over the country. They're worker owned. And uh, each worker is pretty much making the same salary with the exception of the CEO whose salary is voted upon. And um, it's a very democratic process. I think that's one of the distinguishing factors of co-ops is the dem democratic, um, well, the way they work. Uh, the the uh, worker owners have input into what is happening in a much different way or in, in any way whatsoever, because normal businesses, they don't have much input at all. So I think that's, for me, that's one of the biggest differences is the democratic process and the fact that the worker owner is not salaried, but is earning um, as an owner. And it's a very different responsible responsibility level and um, I think that creates a much better feeling in the, in the work environment. So that's, I'll leave it there for now and let Jamila pick up. Yeah, um, I, you know, cooperatives, I like to think of them, um, there's big C cooperative, right? Like when you're incorporated as a cooperatively owned entity. And then there's, I think, little c cooperative, um, where a lot of people engage in shared ownership practices and democratic control of organs of, of work, right, towards um, the ability of people to meet their needs. When I think about a cooperative, um, I think of cooperatives as two pieces, really. And one has to be um, that there is an association of people. Um, and the other piece is the enterprise. And so this is the distinction between um, cooperatives and other traditional forms of, of businesses, right? That the association of people, as Georgia was indicating, democratically own and control the business. And so that's true for any kind of co-op, whether it's a worker-owned co-op, whether it's a food co-op, a housing co-op, a credit union, which some of you might be um, member owners of, of as well, right? There's one 
member one vote applies in the, um, in the co-op model. And then there's the enterprise piece, right? That you're, you're collectively um, organized to own an entity, right? That is meeting needs, right? Providing services. And these things can, you know, apply to housing and food as we've talked about, but also to our, um, when we think about cultural and artistic preservation, right? And ways in which communities organize cooperatively around um, social good and cultural capital as well. Mm -hmm. So democracy is, is sort of important, shared responsibility and shared um, uh, returns. Yes, is that what I'm yes. hearing? Um, yeah. I, 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 I think the ESOP uh, difference is interesting because uh, I believe it stands for Employee Stock Ownership Programs, or possibly right. the P is for right. PIN too, because very Plans. often yeah. it, it'll be a, a, a standard uh, corporate business with a general, you know, a traditional corporate structure, but with this opportunity for. Um, individuals to buy a share of the corporation. And depending on how much uh, money they have and how many shares they purchase, they have a greater say in what happens in the decision-making process, right? Which is different from the, the worker-owned um, structure that Georgia was talking about originally, where you get- Yeah. I, think I, I would say ESOPs are not cooperatives, actually. I would say okay. that- uh, they're yeah, a different formation. Um, although we we do see um, this emergence of what some people call esoperatives, <laughs> right? Where we see this um, once, uh, sometimes when a, a business does become an esop, where an owner is saying, "Okay, I want to have um, the opportunity to share this business using this particular um, uh, share model, the esop, right?" that there is more room to have these conversations, broader conversations and deeper conversations around ownership and de democratic ownership. And really, how do you want to not just like share money, but to share power and decision-making. Um, yeah. and, and ESOPs have the opportunity to kind of be specifically about the, the share of, of the money, right, through that model. But there's also room um, for some of them to convert into cooperatives as well. Yeah, and I, I would agree with uh, Jamila that uh, I don't see ESOPs as cooperatives, even though they're co considered cooperatives, because they're operating differently. And I don't think that the number of shares one has in ESOP, though, means they have more power in the company. I'm not clear about that, but I don't think so. I think it's more about a, a factor of they have more investment rather than they have more power. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify that. Mm -hmm. So so it's not about the power of decision making. It's about the return on the investment. I think which, it's more focused on that. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, that's interesting. Um, so w why do you think that this democratic model of cooperative ownership, sharing ownership, uh, appeals to uh, communities of color and uh, women in particular? Why, why would they be drawn to this model? In your experience, what have you seen? Jamila? Um, so most of my work in um, working in, in co-ops has been in communities of color. And I, coming into this conversation, I've thought about it. I think most of the groups that I've worked with have been women-led like women of color organizing um, in, in formation of cooperatives. And even um, if they're not like distinctly or, or primarily women owned cooperatives, women often are at the home of, of leadership um, within the cooperative structures that I've, I've worked in. And I think that there are a number of reasons why the co-op business model is attractive um, to women, particularly women of color. I've, if in particular, you know, we were talking about the worker-owned um, business model, 
Um, we can think about things like it's really hard to run a business on your own <laughs> by yourself and to resource it, right? So there's the opportunity to come into a, um, into a business and, and inviting others to share and pool their resources into forming a cooperative to perform and, and provide goods and services. I think we also understand the feminization of labor and that so many um, women are engaged in low wage labor sectors, whether it's you know, providing childcare, different kinds of domestic service in our healthcare system. We see a lot of women of color at the lower rung of the earning um, spectrum in these different sectors and industries. And the possibilities that come with um, worker ownership include control, not just of your labor, but of your income, right? So the opportunity for women to have more um, decision-making power to determine for themselves how they want to work, what they want to work on, how they want to get paid, they have control of that. And I think what I see, um, I do a lot of work in organizing with Black-led um, community, Black-led food co-ops actually around the country. And a lot of those also being organized um, and, and headed up by women, where we see, you know, I think for Black communities in particular, coming to the cooperative business model in the 21st century is just a return of practices that Black folks have used for centuries um, to survive and have thriving communities in the United States in particular. Um, Jessica Gordon Nemhart um, has this book called Collective Courage, which tells stories of the histories of um, African American um, cooperative economic uh, development and enterprise building throughout the United States and historically. And so I think there's this return and this understanding that, again, in order for us to be liberated, <laughs> right, under so many of the conditions of oppression, whether they're coming um, through gender, racial, or economic oppression, we have to collectively organize. We have to do it together. Um, and I think that there's a, a, an understanding of that and also understanding of not that we need it, right? Both materially <laughs> and um, in a cultural way. It's a very resonant um, practice that, that continues to, uh, to strengthen in our communities. I think that's a really interesting uh, point that you brought up, Jamila, that um, women of color have had this in their culture or in their uh, history in a way that those of us who the white folks haven't had. And our because our focus has been more individualistic, not so community oriented, uh, more cutthroat, more um, getting ahead, winning. It's, it's a different goal. Than, than what you're talking about. And we have to unlearn that goal in order to really do cooperatives. And I think that's probably the hardest part for white folks in this country mm -hmm. is to unlearn the individualism that is so destructive toward community, that it's kind of that extreme form. And that's, um, I think that's why what you're talking about is, is very exciting really. And some of the, early models I saw in the Bay Area, one was called Wages. It was women who came together and formed a uh, house cleaning cooperative. And a lot were Latino women of color. And this was an extraordinary empowerment for them, not only uh, in that they had their own money and that they had control of their hours, but it also gave them a sense of pride and of purpose that they were able to run their own businesses together or their own business together. And I thought it was very interesting to see how successfully that worked. And I, I've seen that as a model that could work in a lot of other communities. Like where I live, there's a large Latino community. And this to me would be a wonderful way to help start up or to help people learn how to start up. Uh, worker-owned businesses in maybe landscaping, house cleaning, um, child care, a lot of the things that haven't been properly valued in our society. And so I think what you brought up is a really critical piece, Jamila, um, is that our, our group, our demographic has to unlearn in order to learn this model. And I think that's our challenge. 
I mean, and I will just follow up and say the unlearning is universal when we're all growing up, <laughs> right? Under um, <laughs> white supremacist culture and capitalism. Like we are all impacted by that. And I think a lot of, you know, and that's why I said, I, I intentionally use the word return um, in kind of describing how black folks are returning to cooperative economic practices because we're too indoctrinated and mm -hmm. taught and socialized to be individualistic and to pursue the capitalist dream of just, you know, profit over profit over profit. And so there's a lot of unlearning and, and, and healing, right? That all of our communities need to um, experience in order for uh, these long-term existing, you know, these cooperatives and cooperation are tools that humanity across continents, across sex, you know, millennia, we always cooperate, right? So we understand the usefulness of these strategies we find ourselves also coming to them time and time again when we are in um, conditions like we are now, where we have economic, social, and political turmoil. Um, we have to return to ourselves because no one else is there to take care of us. And these, these are the tools that we know that have always stood the test of time for us. Well, I think it's interesting to, to note that in Mondragon, where they started their first co-op in 1956, uh, that was at the time the poorest region of Spain. I th they had as high as 70% unemployment in the 40s. It was really a very downward, um, I guess, economically downward area and a lot of hardship in that region. Mm -hmm. And when this Catholic priest, Dairas Mindy Arrieta, was uh, sent to this town of Mondragon, um, he was challenged to figure out how to help these people when so many of them are unemployed, have no work, have no sense of self-worth. And it was, I think, you know, his idea of creating first a school that would train people so they could get jobs in the uh, industrial sector in Bilbao. And from that training came a group of five men who were able to create their first worker owned business. But it came out of a region of poverty didn't come out of wealth, didn't come out of a sense of people having everything. It came out of a sense of we have nothing. And I don't know how critical that economic reality is to uh, helping these get off the ground. But I do think when people don't see a lot of ways forward, coming together to create cooperatives is a, a viable way to do that. And I, you know, now we have lawyers who specialize in cooperative development. We have companies that consult with people on how to do it. Um, we can put workshops together to, to uh, help people learn what they need to know in order to form a cooperative. So we're way ahead now from what, where Mondragon started. You know, something that strikes me as I've heard you talk about um, this phenomenon is uh, you know, in um, Mondragon, there, there were, he was a, a Catholic priest, right? And um, he had a mission, there was a spiritual mission in mind. And uh, Jamila, you were talking about the, the ways of the Black uh, Baptist Church and uh, how it influenced the neighborhood. And I, I wonder if a piece that has been lost in, um, in, in women's um, you know, quick entry into this economic realm where you know we keep bumping our heads against this glass ceiling, um, isn't the the loss of that sense of um, responsibility that comes with a spiritual um, heritage? You know that 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 is like off subject, right? When you're in the real corporate business world, that that isn't where you go. Um, and, and I do think it, it is an important part of, um, of how we think about the world and the planet and our neighbors and, um, you know, without getting, uh, let's not get religious about it, but <laughs> yeah. we, because we don't want to, because there are those divisions, but there, there is a, you know, a really uh, basic um, spiritual connection that we all know is living um, brothers and sisters. So, um, you know, are, are there particular um, public policies or legislation that you're aware of that um, you think could help 
uh, widen this phenomenon of cooperative business ownership. I know that um, New York, for instance, has invested quite a bit of um, state money in uh, promoting uh, cooperative uh, business education, for instance, and creation of um, of cooperative businesses. Are, are there other uh, movements that you're aware of or policies that you'd like to see come into existence to help make this a better known phenomenon? Well, in California, we've had um, legislation that was passed a couple of years ago that makes it easier for cooperatives to, to uh, raise funds for starting a cooperative. It's very difficult before, so it's actually easier now. It was signed into law by Jerry Brown when he was governor. Um, and then there are organizations here because there is a law firm that deals, deals with helping people set up cooperatives. And there's Project Equity in uh, the East Bay, I think it's in Oakland, that also helps people convert regular businesses to cooperatives or to start cooperatives. So there are specialists in this, which I at some point can put in the chat box. Um, but I wanted to just, if you don't mind, go back to something you said about the religious aspect of, um, or a basis of religious. What I call that is ethics. I don't see it necessarily as religious because I'm not religious, I guess. But when I go to Mondragon, most of the people there are not religious. They don't go to church, but they have an ethical system that is just extraordinary. And they don't talk about it. They just live it. And it took me a couple of times to go there before I understood, oh, they just swim in this water. They don't think to talk about it. Uh, it's just natural to them. And it took me a while, and fortunately I've gone 10 times, so I've learned a lot, um, to see how the ethics just go through every part of their businesses. I mean, it's just part of the way they live. It's part of their business structure. It's how they evaluate things. It's always this ethical uh, basic or foundation for everything they do. I wouldn't call it religious, but I would call it uh, humanist. It's just mm -hmm. very, very humanist, um, empathic, compassionate. Um, it's not something you see in the, in, in the business culture normally, but it, it underlies everything there. So I just wanted to bring that back because I thought it was I've seen it as a very important part of how that has thrived and, and grown to the level it has there. Um, one of the er other areas that's kind of connected to this that I've noticed is that everyone sees when they go there that there's no poverty, there are no slums, there are no people living on the streets. But sometimes it takes a while to notice that also there's no great wealth in, in evidence. There's more a gradation of middle class from, you know, I mean, there's high middle class, but there isn't this ostentatious, huge estates and 25,000 square feet to a house. I mean, people don't live like that. Not only don't they live like that, they don't aspire to live like that. So it's very different than the aspirations that we're dealing with here, where mm -hmm. people are satisfied with community and connection in a way that uh, takes the place of this need for more and more and more and more grandeur. They don't have that aspiration. So I think that's another part of the ethics also. Interesting. Well, I, I, um, I, I was using the word spiritual and I noticed that um, Mary Beth um, in uh, the chat was using the word trust because trust mm -hmm. is also very important and part of that uh, community sense and um, is only possible with uh, a sense of um, spiritual connection or ethical connection. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, we spend, that, that's such an important component of it is the relation, it's deeply relational. And, you know, to, to form an association of people who are going to own and control something together democratically, right? We know we're, we're trying to live in something that's called a democracy. Democracy is messy and it is hard, right? So you have to have, at my, at my work at PACA and a lot of the work that I continue to do, so much of the work is really around the strengthening of the association of people. Because if it's just like a business and the business is doing fine, but the people aren't doing well in cultivating levels of trust and in fairness and justice within their association, then in fact, they are just like traditional business, right? They haven't 
unlearned and, and, and really found a way to distinct, um, distinguish their model and their practices from traditional businesses. So I also like to say co-ops can be co-opted by capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. It's very easy um, mm -hmm. for cooperatives to, to, to lean less into those funded foundational democratic um, values. And I think in some, to some degree, we see that actually expressed, Ricky, um, towards your question about advocacy and policy. You know, when we see um, the neglect, actually, particularly at the federal um, level, it's been a really challenging road to get federal support for cooperative development outside of um, agriculture. And, you know, where we know the, the U.S. government um, started off <laughs> with their um, huge investment in cooperatives was actually rural electric right, under Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. He called for the big conglomerates and corporations to help electrify the United States, and they said no. And so rural communities all across this country organized into these associations of people to form cooperatives and get that money to electrify their towns. And that's how the United States got electrified, right? Mm -hmm. It's cooperatives. And so mm -hmm. we see certain sectors um, being able to organize um, within, um, like historically, have had that representation. And it's true, a lot of um, the USDA is probably uh, the federal organization that provides the largest kind of grant money available um, to um, cooperatives. But, you know, on the worker co-op side in the U.S. over the last several years, they've been working um, with the National um, Cooperative Business Association, NCBA, the US um, oh, Federation of Worker Cooperatives and other organizations to get legislation passed for the Small Business um, Association to make some of the rules that they have in place around lending to cooperatives, worker-owned cooperatives less stringent. Um, to also provide more resources for technical assistance to cooperatives. So there's this huge, um, movement that's kind of going very slowly at the federal level, but what we do see increasingly is um, at the local level, cities from, you know, Los Angeles, New York City to Chicago is about to get millions, millions of dollars in cooperative development, a lot of it focused on worker co-op development. And Philadelphia, we had um, some movement in that way. And it's a challenging thing because every state has their own separate right. um, statutes about cooperatives and how they're yeah. formed in, in, um, and uh, regulated with, at the state level. Yeah, that does make it more complicated. Mm -hmm. Some of the questions that we had from our audience had to do with uh, really practical questions like, uh, that this would apply to. Uh, how do you start a co-op? Well, part of it depends on where are you, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Part of it depends on where are you and then getting the right advice. There are organizations, there are lawyers, uh, law firms that deal specifically with um, cooperatives. In San Francisco, there's one. There's um, Project Equity that I mentioned before. There are definitely consultants and organizations that will help people start cooperatives. And one thing I wanted to bring up because we mentioned or, or referred to a, a consensus and how, how decision-making happens in a cooperative. And I, I've often remembered when Alvarado Street Bakery began in the 70s, and it's a very successful worker-owned wholesale bakery in Petaluma, California, and they sell bread all over the US. And the former CEO who retired told me that um, when they first started in the 70s, it was kind of like a hippie co-op. They wanted it to be a cooperative, and it was, but they were spending so much of their time in, in meetings to, uh, because everyone had to agree on everything. And that was their idea of consensus. It is not the idea of Mondragon's consensus. Not 100% agreement is really possible most of the time. But they had that model in their heads, fixated in their heads, that uh, everyone had to agree on everything they did. And finally, at one point, they realized either we're going to be in meetings all the time 
or we're going to create a business <laughs> and we're going to keep it going. So they decided that the 100% consensus was not practical. And um, it was majority. And usually it was more than just a simple majority. But that maturing of, of their understanding was that, no, we can't 100% agree. We have to agree to sometimes follow the majority because we are all in this together. And I think that's a hard lesson for people who think there should be actually equality across the board. Everyone's vote is just as important. Um, so that's part of the democratic process that's messy that I think Jamila was referring to earlier. It is messy, but one can't spend all their time in meetings working things out or else no work will get done. So I think that's another part of um, the de democratic aspect of funding. Yeah. I mean, and I think that, you know, also speaks to underdevelopment um, and, and education oftentimes of, of what, it, what is and what tools are available for folks to learn to make decisions together, um, how, to, how to govern, how to manage, how to own. Those are very distinct roles and sets of responsibilities within cooperatives that um, in any cooperative, you know, whether it's worker owned or consumer owned or otherwise, there are different stakeholder interests, right? So, um, and, and this is usually where it can be very helpful for people looking to form cooperatives. One, um, there's a long tradition in African-American communities of engaging in study before <laughs> jumping into creating a business. Right. So before you, you call the lawyer and start filing incorporation papers, like actually learn about what is this thing you're trying to be? Learn about the, the thing you're trying to provide, the good or service that you're trying to provide, but also what is this formation? And what are the skills and tools that we need and how do we begin to practice that as early as possible, even with these small decisions at the very you know, starting entry phases, right? Begin, these are the seedlings of like how your democratic process and practice are gonna be cultivated. But the study is really important. And then you know, certainly ensuring that you bring in um, cooperative developers and consultants to support you and you know, formalizing things, doing some of that business training kinds of work. A lot of people who are coming to this have never been business owners before. Right. They are not entrepreneurial, so they don't have these skills. Um, so having you know, partners who are working alongside you um, to support you in developing a business plan. You know, a lot of lawyers, um, it, it depends. Access to legal support for cooperatives is very dicey depending on where you are, because mm -hmm. some states don't have lots of co-op lawyers or, co you know, attorneys who are familiar with the cooperative law in the state that they're practicing. And so you can go to an attorney who, you know, will pull up some bylaws for you, but they might not really be very relevant to you trying to form a co-op. So you need the experts on your team and, you know, giving you advice um, to support you, whether you're finding the you know, a co-op lawyer or some other lawyer, ensuring that you have co-op experts on your side to help with your business planning and with your organizational development would be key. That was one of the things I was thinking here for our local community is we need to have panels, workshops that give the overview of how a cooperative would start, what people need to learn, what they need to know, and uh, start with people who have some business sense or knowledge already. Uh, to begin that learning process. So people do need to come up to speed with, I think, workshops or panels or both to see if it really is going to work for them. One of the uh, things I'm going to put in the chat box right now for people on the West Coast is the California Center for Cooperative Development, which is located in Davis, California, is also a really good resource for people. And they put on a yearly conference. I think, I don't, I'm not sure if it's in April this year, it's usually in April, uh, somewhere in California. And it's a great place to meet other people who uh, both have cooperatives or part of cooperatives right now, or are looking to learn to how to do this. It's the, a great place to make all those connections because they attract people working in cooperatives across the country. Yeah. 
Yeah, I see in the in the chat some of these um, inquiries about where do we find this stuff. I mean, and de depending on the kind of co-op that you're trying to form, you're going to find experts um, who are going to be able to support you in developing a particular kind of co-op. So the Democracy at Work Institute is also a really important starting place for lots of folks interested in finding out how to form worker-owned cooperatives. So that's at institute.coop. They provide lots of entry-level training and webinars, as well as providing access to, um, you know, guides and um, and toolkits for for how tos. Mm -hmm. um, if you're interested in food, the Food Co-op Initiative is a great place to go to support folks who are um, aiming to start food cooperatives um, in 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 their community. So there's a lot of opportunity. Um, and resources available. Um, the National Black, uh, I'm sorry, the National um, Cooperative Business Association is also, it's a it's an, the Apex kind of membership organization for co-ops. Um, their websites also have, they, they also kind of are, are multi-sectoral. So they're providing resources for all kinds of co-ops, right? So that might be another um, really great place to try to find some support and get introduced to um, resources about the kinds of co-ops you might want to be. Well, I want to mention one in New York, uh, Omar Friella, who founded the Green Worker Cooperatives. He was on one of our trips to Mondragon and he they have a co-op academy. So if you're in the New York area, there's a worker growing worker owned cooperative movement in New York City that uh, they help people learn how to do that in the academy. So there's also that. I'll put his name and information in the chat box as well. Right. Uh, University of Wisconsin has a center yes. on uh, cooperative uh, development. Yeah, we've got a lot of resources there. But there's a lot to learn because there are so many different kinds of uh, cooperatives. One question that I see in the Q&A here or in the chat actually, um, is how much capital is necessary to start a co-op? Uh, how much money do you have to have to start a co-op? And again, the question I suppose is, well, what sort of co-op are you thinking about? And how large is the association of owners that you put together? Um, and if you don't, if this is just an idea in your head and you'd like to do this uh, and you don't have, um, other other people. I, I noticed there was a baker uh, who wanted to start a cooperative baker and knew that, or, or perhaps it was a food hub, and uh, knew that they had to have more um, more owners in order to have it be self sustaining. How how do you go about finding those kinds of uh, resources in your community? <laughs> Yeah, it's very, um, it depends, right? So many of our, um, so much of cooperative work is happening at the hyper local level, right? So in Philadelphia, for example, we have the Philadelphia Area Cooperative Alliance, but there are, that that is like a hub of being able to say, so you want to start a co-op? go here first, right? And these are the people who are closest to you on the ground with the expertise to help you begin your journey. It's also true that a lot of our communities, whether you know urban or rural, don't have cooperative ecosystems really well developed yet to support cooperative development at a certain level. Um, and so you might not find that holistic um, support locally and you'll need to kind of turn to some of these national um, providers that are going to be able to link you to sector specific um, resources um, and, and, you know, and, and try to help you along the way. Yeah, I think there are lots of resources. It's a matter of one has to find it in their own state, I think, because they're going to be talking about the laws in that particular state the requirements in that state. So I think in a way you have to go to the resources in your own state. Yeah, and I think that's why, you know, I think the, to um, Ricky's point about the Wisconsin um, Center is a really great 
resource because they have um, information about cooperatives and maps and developer um, resources that you can look at um, for, for how to make entry across the country. And you can find your, your, your representative there. Maybe we should try to throw that link. <laughs> And I will just throw out the uh, both of you who are registered for this uh, have access to a <clears throat> curriculum for further learning, which has a list of resources on it, uh, along with some definitions and some, um, you know, the different types of cooperatives there are and um, the seven uh, principles of cooperatives. Um, do either of you have those right at hand? I didn't print that yes. out myself. <laughs> yeah, there are seven cooperative principles. I love this game. What are they? <laughs> um, I mean, they, they start with, you know, member owner, member ownership and control, democratic member control, right? Mm -hmm. um, everybody's got to put something in. There has to be some kind of equity investment. Um, right. Cooperatives can, can determine what that needs to look like um, on their own. Some kind of economic, um, depending something, on. Something, yeah, some, some kind of economic um, contribution. Um, autonomy mm -hmm. and control. Cooperatives, or autonomy and independence, right? Cooperatives also aim to, um, to stand on their own ground, right? To not um, be too, um, to not be controlled by external forces, whether those, you know, you happen to, get state money to do a thing and now you're beholden to the state or you know being beholden to uh, other kinds of um, partner organizations maintaining your autonomy and independence as um, as an enterprise is another principle um, education <laughs> and access to information are also really important um, cooperation amongst cooperatives co-ops support co-ops if you are someplace and you know that there is a co-op there, ask your co-op how to get co you know, ask that people in that co-op who work there, who shop there, whatever it is, you know, ask them questions about how you might um, get access to information to, to start your own cooperative. And then there's concern for community, right? We, we are stewards of the, of the places and the communities in which our cooperate, our co-ops operate. Um, and so the, there's this aim to really ensure that we're not being extractive, right? And that we're really thinking about um, people, planet, and profit and undertaking these, um, these engagements. I don't know if I went through all seven, but I probably got pretty close. I think so. Very good. I'm gonna add, <laughs> I'm gonna add one and amplify one. Um, mm. I'm gonna add one that's, that's part of the um, princ core principles of Mondragon, because I think it really struck me the first time I saw it. I thought, God, I wouldn't even think they would think of something like this. But one of their core principles is social transformation. And that really struck me. It's like not just the co-op that you're doing, but the whole society and culture is part of this vision and part of this reality. So it's a real big framework. It's not just my little business or our little business, it's the whole culture. And uh, when Jamila talked about, inter well, what they call intercooperation, cooperatives helping cooperatives, they have, of course, a huge umbrella of over a hundred cooperative businesses. So, but they do help each other. And when one went bankrupt, the others all moved in to help that one that went bankrupt. They hired mm -hmm. some of the people who no longer had jobs. They um, were able to retire some people early because their pensions were good enough. And they were able to make sure that everybody was covered. And because they have their own internal insurance, they were able to give people, the workers who lost their jobs, 80% of their salary for up to two years if they weren't able to get on their job. So this is an extraordinary um, demonstration of intercooperation yeah. between cooperatives. And that, I think understanding this overall model is very helpful to getting one's mind into what cooperative really means in the larger framework of society. Really? Yeah. We've got a great question here. Um, 
the uh, one of our uh, attendees, Paul Basich, says the experience of cooperatives in Europe is deep and long lasting, especially worker co-ops and uh, co-op housing. It's part of a culture there that is maintained and fostered. Why do you think it's so hard to overcome the institutional bias we Americans have all around us? Why do you think that's so hard? And what can we do about it, I suppose, is the other uh, not the other part of that question. Well, that's been a this... question of mine as well. And maybe Jamila can help with it because I have had this question <laughs> for a long time. It's like, how can we change this mindset from the um, profit uber alles, which is kind of our yeah. MO here, to community? And it's really yeah. hard for the way we've been trained to unlearn this and i think we have to help each other i don't think we can do it on our own i really think it's i mean the the, the co-ops in europe and, and we can even look to our neighbors north of us in canada right um they are strong because they are organized <laughs> and they have governments that invest in subsidized co-op co right. development right that's why they exist and why they are such robust contributions to economics um, in their countries. They organized. <laughs> they organized. You know, <laughs> and, and they got people, they understood the importance of, you know, organizing collectively at the local level, but then right. ensuring that ecosystems are developed to sustain the cooperative model. So just as so many of our corporate organizations are subsidized, we see, you know, co-ops in order to survive and thrive also need to be subsidized and recognized um, as this viable, um, equitable economic model that can really be beneficial. And that's part of the challenge that is rising up, you know, from the municipal level to the state level mm -hmm. to the federal level, but it takes people power. I think, you know, it's the one, I look at food co-ops across the country, when a project that I'm working on now, um, I'm really excited about this, but here in Philadelphia, we probably have one, two, we have four, at least four brick and mortar food cooperatives that are running. They're open operating in the city of Philadelphia. There are literally tens of thousands of humans who belong to these cooperatives. And our cooperatives don't organize together or even within themselves really towards political change and transformation at the local level, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm working with an organization um, that has been doing this work, <laughs> like organizing um, um, in communities of color around political power and you know, getting them to be able to help people show up in electoral politics. The woman who um, runs this organization is also president of her food co-op. And she and I had the same vision. We were like, food co-ops have people. We should be organizing our cooperatives for economic and political power, <laughs> right? Because if we gain the political power, we'll have more access and more control of how the economics, um, how economic power is distributed um, within our communities. And so the, the potential is there. It is, it is right in front of us. Now, I think this organizing idea is really important. And it's a, something that I don't think a lot of people think of when they want to start a co-op or a business is organizing with other people and understanding that creating a co-op is a political move. It is political. And uh, one uh, thing that I didn't know when I first went to Spain to Mondragon was that Mondragon has over hundred cooperatives, but then that vast region of Spain has another thousand worker-owned businesses. So it's a huge part of the culture. It wasn't that way yeah. 70 years ago, but it is today. And you think, wow, if they could do that in such a short amount of time, I mean, it took less than 70, it was more like 40 or 50, uh, we could do the same thing. You know, it's, it is organizing, it is educating and understanding. And I think when you see that it can be done one place, you know it can be done yeah. in other places. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Well, a, a big piece of uh, that organizing for political power has to do 
with economics, with uh, that federal and state and city um, financial support and drive to a particular goal um, that is so important and is often the, the critical piece that's missing. So um, if let's say that we have organized an association of people who have studied what a cooperative is and what their particular cooperative wants to accomplish. Um, <clears throat> and they, they, they need some startup money. They, need, uh, they know that they can't uh, pay themselves for the first two years until they reach a certain level of um, <clears throat> productivity to be sustainable. So where would they go to find financing generally? Hmm? Well, I saw somebody in, in the comments already um, put a link to the seed commons, right, so um, which uh -huh. was really good. Um, you know, financing is, is tricky or can be tricky if you try to approach traditional lenders um, because the co-op business model you're like, well, who, if you def like, who am I going to go get this money from if this little project doesn't work? And they're looking for a person, right? And when it's a co op, you have all these people who own it together. And so traditional banks are freaked out because of personal guarantees, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So there's this big challenge um, in traditional financing um, to capitalize co ops at, um, at a certain level. It gets easier, you know, of course, once you get some money, then it's easier to get money for um, traditional um, lenders. But I think, you know, for a lot of folks, the same traditional barriers that exist for, uh, for folks, bad credit or whatever that means, right? Um, you don't have money, <laughs> so it's hard to get money, right? Um, all of those traditional barriers that are in place for any other entrepreneur exist, um, for people trying to form cooperatives. Um, there are you know, solutions like the, the Seed Commons, um, Capital Impact Partners, um, Shared Capital, the National Cooperative Bank. There are lenders who are friendly to cooperatives mm -hmm. who are also trying to grow in their understanding of how to not, um, how to not be extractive. Right, so this is one of the reasons why the seed commons is so um, such a promising and an essential component to our ecosystem is that they're really trying to provide cooperatives, mostly in non-traditional, um, marginalized communities, with access to capital that they wouldn't traditionally have. And then they're also doing the work of supporting those co-ops and being ready to to take on the debt, right? So we're gonna do this technical assistance work. We're gonna do this financial training work with you to make sure that you are ready to take on this capital. And once you do, we're gonna to continue to support you and your business to make sure that you can pay it back. And we're not gonna start asking you to pay back these loans until you make a profit, right? So there's this wrap around strategy for really thinking about how to engage in communities and you know, what used to be common ways about relationship and trust and shared, you know, interest and not just, you know, an interest rate and, and return on investment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interest rate is another interesting thing to bring up. Um, I don't know <laughs> what norm normally loans like this would be, but I think we're looking at pretty high interest rates for loans and, um, at some point, they might even be called usury. You don't find these in other countries the same way we do here. So I don't know how much of a barrier that is also. Do you have experience with that, Jamila? I mean, I think lending is, is, is complicated. I'm not an expert in that area. I do think, you know, some of what is happening is um, more and more communities of color are turning to this model. Um, particularly in the food co-op sector, we're seeing philanthropy get involved. We're seeing anchor institutions. Right. You look at, um, oh, oh gosh, why am I not remembering that project in Cleveland um, where the anchor institutions Evergreen. have come to, Evergreen, yeah, to come together to say, we all use laundry 
How about we support a local cooperative in handling these service, services for us? And what else could we determine should be cooperatively run so that we can keep funds and, and money moving and, and support our local communities and generating wealth, right? So really thinking about, um, you know, you have hospitals that are donating to food co-ops because they're seeing food co-ops as or like, you know, food is in food insecurity and food access are part of determinants of health, right? So right. they're making these kinds of investments because they see that this is a way of helping them to fulfill their mission, right? And so we're seeing um, philanthropy also align in this way that has, you know, it, it is a little bit untraditional for, for that particular business model. Could, could, do you know something about the National Cooperative Bank and how, um difficult, easy, complicated, whatever it is, dealing with them and starting a, a getting a loan for starting a co-op? I mean, I, I think they have different entry points. Okay. Um, they have an interesting history, actually, that um, in, in terms of how they were formed, the National um, Cooperative Bank was actually in the United States was actually formed out of the civil rights movement. Um, it was an, an outcome of, 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 of folks organizing the civil rights movement towards economic justice as part of the work that Martin Luther King Jr. and others were doing. Wow. Um, and so they have this, this historic commitment to really be present and available to uh, marginalized communities or uh, communities that are non, not traditionally don't have access to that kind of capital. You know, how, what, what they're, what their record is on it, I don't know. But you know, it's 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 a challenge to get money if you're not already coming from money. Right. And we know this to just be a systemic and structural impediment for all kinds of access to capital in this country. Um, and so, but they, but you know, there are rounds of of grants, rounds of. Um, loan forgiveness and different tools that um, some of these lenders will, will use to try to make the barriers to entry a little um, lower. But I think, you know, the, the other piece is that the organization, the, the co-ops have to be ready. They have to be ready. So you can't just say, oh, I got a co-op. I have these people. You got to have your business plan. You got to have like, <laughs> you know, your market study, your feasibility. So you got to have these pieces to demonstrate that you can do what it is that you're saying that you want to do. But you still have to be a viable investment um, for, for a lender or someone who wants to give you money. I mean, and then there's, you know, some cooperatives also structure themselves so that they can have um, multi-stakeholder ownership structures, right? right? So that Part of what they're able to do is, you know, they'll have the, the worker owners, but maybe they'll have like an investor that has another kind of um, ownership stake, right? That doesn't diminish the power and autonomy of the worker owners, but does allow them to have an infusion of capital, um, you know, at a, at a, and would allow that um, investor to also have a return on their investment at a non-extractive capacity. I think philanthropy is an interesting um, possibility. It's, it's a new area for philanthropy, but it certainly would make sense that they, uh, the people who have foundations are educated about this possibility to be Absolutely. open to it. And um, maybe that's one of the first steps is to educate some of the people at the foundations about this possibility and being open mm -hmm. to helping to fund a new economic model that will serve a lot of people. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, that's how a lot of the co-ops are actually receiving the technical assistance that they're mm -hmm. getting from is because um, groups like Project Equity, um, Democracy at Work Institute, Philadelphia Area Cooperative Alliance, like they're all formed as nonprofit organizations. So they're, yeah. they're getting the grant money um, for, from foundations. Um, and passing it along through their services um, to the co-ops in many ways. But you know, that that is also also shifting where some of those funders are starting to fund the co-ops directly as well. Uh, the actual co-ops, because these are the consultants 
And so yeah, was, like the developer and yeah, centers right. are, are being provided for, but you're seeing some some shifts happening where philanthropy, you know, some funders are directly investing in the co-ops. Great. Part of that organizing effort that um, you were talking about, Jamila, um, that kind of education is is part of that organizing um, effort, I think. Uh, and I'm thinking about uh, you know networks of um, I can't can't think of the name offhand, but I know that there are a number of women's um, investment um, mm -hmm. organizations that I think would be interested in learning more about this um, business model and um, the wisdom of investing in um, a cooperative worker owned business um, might be interesting. Another educational piece. We have wonder, more wonderful questions and wonderful resources in the chat. Um, people have asked, uh, how do I copy the chat? Um, I, I've had the same trouble myself, but we will be sending you a, a recording of uh, this conversation and also the chat. Uh, those of you who, who have registered and you can feel free to, to share that um, as you can. Um, how are we doing time-wise, um, Mary Beth oh, I, or Carmen? Yeah, this are is we, Carmen. We have about seven minutes left. All right. Well, um, let's let's talk. Uh, let's wind this up a little bit. And um, uh, I have a couple of things that I want to share. Uh, I have to look at my script. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, while you're doing that, can I just respond to um, the question about unions versus co-op? Oh, yes, please. Oh, excellent. Yeah, we do. Good one. Good one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, we see um, unions being um, a strategy for workers to use in organizations where there are these hierarchical structures of like ownership, management, and then the workers. And so there's this collective bargaining thing, right, where you're just trying to to ask for things, right? You don't actually have the power to decide that you want them. You have to ask for them and negotiate to get them. In a cooperative, you already have it, it's yours. So there, you know, as, and, and when you are negotiating, you're negotiating with the other owners of the co-op. To complicate that, some cooperatives do actually also have unions. <laughs> um, <laughs> So there are such things as, as union co-ops and those can be consumer co-ops, they can be worker co owned co-ops as well that have unions. But again, the unions are in place often um, to ensure worker rights, right? Particularly for workers who are not in the owner class within the co-op. Hmm. I know at Bondragon they have what they call social councils that, um, they don't have unions or they don't really need unions for the same reasons that you mentioned, Jamila, but they have social councils to deal with any um, problems that might develop between people or between someone and the business manager. They have those councils to, to handle situations like that. So they don't ignore it, uh, but they don't need a union uh, to represent a worker owner for the same reason that she mentioned that they have the power. Well, I, I do think we're going to have to uh, wrap up. I want to uh, ask uh, folks down here, you know, on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a place where you can raise your hand. And uh, I'd, I'd love to know how many of you uh, learned something from this conversation. Um, raise your hand if you uh, appreciate some of the things that we talked about. Do I see any hand raisers? People are looking for, where is that hand? Yeah. <laughs> Bottom of the screen. <laughs> I thought so too. Carmen. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Carmen, would you uh, please share the, the next slide? Yeah, thank you. How many of you uh, wish we had a little bit more time to talk about, to answer all the questions, the great questions that you had um, to, uh, yeah, more hand raises. Thank you. Um, I wanna thank uh, both of you and I, and I want to uh, just uh, urge you to take a look at the uh, document for further learning. 
which has resources from uh, all four of our um, participants, um, two of whom couldn't be here, Rosie and uh, with the Detroit Community Wealth Fund uh, would have added a great deal, I know, and uh, so would Marjorie Kelly with the Democracy Collaborative and her project 50 by 50, which has, is particularly aimed at developing more worker-owned uh, businesses around the country. So. Um, these are great resources, and you'll find more information about them on the um, on the uh, document for further learning. So um, thanks so much, all of you, uh, Jamila, all of you, Jamila and Georgia. <laughs> You're welcome. It's been a wonderful hour and a half. It has. Yes. Really thanks so much. <laughs> Um, so next, the next one, could you just, uh, I, I wanted to uh, assure everybody who is here that you will be receiving a recording of this um, conversation that you can share with others. And I wanna show you our, our new um, uh, YouTube channel, An Economy of Our Own. We post all of our conversations, all of our Zooms of our own on um, our, our channel. We've, this shows you five of them, but they're on any number of topics. Uh, ranging from, uh, you know, feminist future goals, uh, the GDP, um, environmental uh, justice, and um, other kinds of concerns. So check it out. Uh, we'll put a link to that YouTube channel in the chat. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we want to draw your attention to uh, another event that's happening on April 8th. Uh, we're sponsoring along with the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom and the Public Banking Institute and the California Public Banking Alliance, uh, what we're calling a learning circle for public banking starting on April 8th. It's a little bit different from our Zoom conversations, a more intensive uh, workshop setting where we're gonna meet uh, a total of six times, I think it is. Um, Mary Beth, I forget now, can you, um, you're now unable to talk about this, I think. Is that right? I think that's right, Carmen. <laughs> because she's an attendee. Um, but anyway, check out our website, www.aneconomyofourown.org. Look under the events and you'll see the Public Banking Learning Circle, which starts on April 8th. We'll meet every three weeks for six uh, sessions in a row and you'll learn a great deal about what public banking is exactly, how it can address many uh, issues, including financing cooperatives. That could be one of the goals for your uh, local public bank. And um, we uh, will bring in uh, people across the country, uh, 10 states in total that are working on uh, creating public banks. So if you're curious about what they are and how they might help your community, uh, take a look at our webpage. Um, and uh, next uh, slide, yeah. Thanks very much to all of our audience for joining us with such uh, great questions and uh, other engagement, other subjects that came up in the chat. I'm gonna look forward to looking more closely at the chat when I get home. Um, but uh, we want you to know that we're lifting up every woman's expertise in economics and the men who love us too, and who actually, um, listen to us and are interested in what we have to say and what we're thinking about. So thank you very much for joining our event tonight. Do stay in touch. And um, thanks again to everyone. Good night now. Bye. Bye bye. Th thanks again, Jamila, Georgia, your peaches, both of you, everyone, <laughs> good night. <laughs> thank you, Ricky, for hosting. Sure.